I think we can go ahead and get started. We're almost at 1210. Um, so on behalf of the uh, Biology Seminar Committee, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to have our annual BMC uh, hosted seminar. And um, I just wanted to um, make sure that all the students, whether you're in uh, biology or, or um, in the BMC, program, um, uh, you're welcome to join our speaker after uh, the seminar around 1.15 for um, a virtual lunch that's very casual um, to chat with our speaker today. So um, check your email uh, for that link. It should be, have been sent out pretty recently. Um, and just a reminder for everyone to keep their microphones muted during the seminar. Um, and, um, and for most people to keep your videos off just to reduce kind of the bandwidth um, needed uh, and um, internet connection kind of strain. Um, and there will be a, uh, a question and answer session um, after the seminar. So um, uh, another seminar committee member will take care of that. Um, so now I'll uh, let um, David introduce our speaker. Thanks, Kelly. I'm, uh, I'm Dave Mazursky, one of the biology, uh, biomedical communications faculty members in the Department of Biology. And it's my honor today to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Patrick Lynch. Pat is an award-winning author, artist, and photographer. Over his 45-year career at Yale University, he served as an interactive media designer, medical illustrator, biomedical and scientific photographer, filmmaker, and director of web, media, and communications departments. Pat has written over 100 professional papers and book chapters and 10 books published by Yale University Press. He is the illustrator and co-author with ornithologist Noble Proctor of Manual of Ornithology, Avian Structure and Function, an essential reference guide to avian anatomy. The fourth, uh, fourth edition of the book Web Style Guide, co-authored with Sarah Horton, has been published in 11 languages and was named one of Amazon's top 100 web books in 1999. In 2005, Yale University Press published A Field Guide to North, uh, North Atlantic Wildlife, which Pat co-authored and illustrated with his frequent collaborator, Noble Proctor. This classic field guide contains over 100 full-color plates of over 300 species of ocean wildlife. Pat retired from Yale in 2016 to concentrate full-time on his book projects, photography, and oil painting. His latest field guide, the fifth, is A Field Guide to Long Island Sound, published in 2017. You can visit his website, coastfieldguides.com, to learn more about his books, view examples of his incredible art and photography, and find some delicious food and drink recipes as well. Please extend a warm welcome to Patrick Lynch. Thanks very much, David. And I make a killer pizza, too. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can get this rolling. So hopefully you're looking at a snowy owl now. Good. Okay. So thanks very much. It's a great honor to uh, um, uh, 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 be invited to speak. I, I visited briefly your old location years ago, and I know um, Nick and David and other folks there, so it's it's great to be back. Um, I started as uh, at Yale School of Medicine as a photographer's assistant on Valentine's Day in 1972. And the uh, dark rooms um, were being renovated and they weren't quite ready yet when I started. So after knocking around the office, learning how to draw graphs and miscellaneous stuff, um, uh, an ENT surgeon walked in and needed some illustrations and no one else was available. So that was the start of my medical illustration career. I was always into anatomy. And uh, it spent a lot of high school learning human musculoskeletal anatomy, really just to learn how to draw people. Um, but it sort of, I was always into biology and natural history and stuff. And so it just sort of evolved from there. So I should say to the students, I'm not a graduate of, of one of the medical illustration programs, but because by the time I was thinking about grad school, I had already been illustrating for five or six years. So 
um, uh, I'm a sort of homegrown creature that probably doesn't exist anymore, but you know, all this was 50 years ago. So um, I did lots of different things over the years, uh, technology projects, web projects, as Dave said, video, other kinds of things. Um, but I was always into natural history. And uh, that was a sort of parallel thread to whatever it is I was doing in my day job. So lots of natural history, lots of birding, uh, been a photographer, briefly wandered into software development and interactive media stuff. Uh, I've always done a lot of writing. And for the last several years in my career at Yale, I was mostly involved in um, public relations and doing uh, short films for, for online stuff. And um, I work in Photoshop. 99% of my um, uh illustrations are done in Photoshop, have been digital for decades now, and I'll explain why. Uh, but um, I'm always baffled when I, mean, I show things like this to people and they say, did you do that by hand? And I don't, I don't know what to say to them, but um, yes, every line that you see on the screen was put there by me in pretty much the same technique uh, that I used to use in in uh, what's called gouache or opaque watercolor years ago. This is from way back when, a jeer falcon. But my technique really hasn't changed all that much, except that it sort of got translated pretty much whole into the digital world. So uh, a long time ago, I, I stuck with um, conventional illustration probably years after I started using Photoshop, because I in the early days, there weren't good um, graphics tablets and other kinds of things and the software needed to mature. Uh, but but um, uh, pretty much I, you know, years ago, I don't know, in the maybe 19, uh, early 1990s, late 80s, I switched to digital and never looked back. Since this is Toronto, um, I have to mention um, uh, one of my heroes um, uh, taught for a long time in your program, Steve Gilbert. I knew about Steve's work because I was really into comparative anatomy and, and anatomical structure and pen and ink work. This is uh, from uh, our lab manual of ornithology uh, I did years ago. And um, so Steve was one of my heroes, not just because of his superb illustrations, but also because he put together his own projects, his own video, uh, uh, visual projects. And that I found uh, really inspirational as well. So wherever you are, Steve, um, uh, your influence lives on very much, as does um, all the experience I had way back when with, um, with pen and ink. Uh, I did these in the uh, late 80s and um, early 1990s uh, when I still had a good supply of classic sort of 1940s to 1960s era Esterbrook and uh, very high-end Jalot points and whatnot, but those are all gone now. The current points I just hate, and so I stopped doing uh, pen and ink a long time ago, but the influence lives on, as, as I'll point out when I show you some Photoshop stuff. Um, people ask me if I miss the old days at all. Some people are in, still into silver photography and whatnot, is you've had to stand in a dark room being marinated in fixer and stop bath for eight hours a day for months on end um, to know that no photographer I know has the slightest interest in going back to the old silver days or to, you know, um, uh, videotapes and umatic and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I was delighted to leave it all behind. And now what used to take literally rooms and rooms of big, expensive equipment that you can never afford to buy yourself has now all collapsed down into my trusty iMac. And in fact, it's not just that I can do all those things, but but um, probably 90% of them, I can do it much, much better than I was able to do with the old traditional tools that I used for decades. I'm, I'm always um, sort of amused when I see these um, lean, clean Apple hero shots, uh, because where are all the cords? Um, this is my actual setup, um, which is um, a nightmare tangle of USB cords and stacks of hard drives and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, 
but um, uh, it, it, it's just delightful to me. I left Yale behind and I've, uh, I, I miss the, the friends and, and some of the work I did, but um, there's nothing that, that Yale could supply me. And this has been true for decades as well, that I couldn't just easily do myself with my own cameras and my own comp fairly affordable computer and whatnot. My IMAX is probably a little more souped up than the average one with fastest processors and, and as much RAM as I could stuff in into it. But otherwise, it's just an iMac and it's just fine. Um, so uh, a lot of what I used to do in gouache, I now do in Photoshop. And probably if you're into Photoshop and whatnot, every line that you see here was put on into the file by me by hand. Um, there's no filters that I use or anything else that do much uh, for me. Occasionally, as you see here with the linen background texture, uh, this was not done as an illustration for a book, but it's, it's just a sort of warm up project after I hadn't been illustrating for a while. And so I threw in a linen background, but that kind of filtering is about the only thing I ever do. 99% of what you're going to see was done by um, hard round brushes in Photoshop from two to maybe six or seven pixels sometimes, depending on the resolution of the piece. And every line was put there by hand with a graphics tablet. Um, I know that uh, there are lots of tablets, Cintiq and other um, tablets that have monitors built in now, but I've been using a graphics tablet where I draw one place and look another for so long now that it's as natural as breathing. So I, I just got another brand new uh, plain Wacom tablet uh, just in, in case this one finally dies. And um, uh, and so that's how I do the stuff. The What looks like um, a $2 piece of plastic pen there um, will cost you about a hundred bucks if you lose it, but um, it, it's it's pressure sensitive. So um, a lot of those things that I used to do in pen and ink, I'm able to do with a very fine uh, pressure sensitivity of, of the stylus uh, working with my uh, graphics tablet. The glove and all the dustiness comes from um, spending when I'm doing a lot of illustration, eight hours a day rubbing the heel of my hand against a big sheet of plastic. And that's not only bad because it gets uncomfortable after a while from the friction, but also because um, I don't want my line work to stutter from the friction of running my hand across plastic. So I'm wearing that sort of half glove that cuts down the friction and all the dustiness is cornstarch baby powder, um, just to give me an additional slickness over the surface there. And um, yes, I do it all by hand. Uh, uh, as I say, every line that you see in this Harlequin duck head was put there by me. Um, and the, the magic stuff, um, if Photoshop does anything magical for illustrators, it's uh, two things. One is undo, is I can work very, very fast because I'm not worried about screwing up an illustration I've spent days and days on. Um, in the old days when I was working in watercolor, um, things would sort of asymptotically slow down, you know, as you got further and further into your illustration and you got more and more worried about screwing up a week's work with, you know, a, a, a wrong move. There's nothing about, you know, uh, digital tools that, that um, makes me worry about that. I keep lots of versions of, of things that I've been working on for a long time um, and, and, um, and there's undo. So at, at, you know, in a disaster scenario, and by the way, all the files are on Dropbox um, in addition to my own local hard drives. So not worried about losing more than, you know, maybe an hour's work or something um, in Photoshop. And, and I can do um, these things really, really fast, maybe 20% of the time 
a conventional illustration. And it's not because Photoshop has done anything robotic for me. It's because I can work really, really fast without ever worrying that I'm going to screw something up. And so I'm just scribbling away on the screen. And, um, and that's how the illustrations are built up. But ironically, it's not that different from what I was doing in colored pencils and gouache you know, 40 years ago in terms of the overall technique. 99% of what you're seeing was done, as I said, with a hard round Photoshop brush from two pixels up to maybe seven or eight pixels, depending on the size of the file. And pretty much uh, when you look close up at stuff, it is all just scribbling. I can work really, really fast because uh, I'm not worried about messing up anything. And it gives me a kind of looseness and speed of work that is really helpful, especially because, you know, the, and I'll talk a little bit about that, the, the technique is fairly painstaking because in my books, as I'll show you how I mix things later on, um, uh, traditional kind of watercolor illustrations of the kind I used to do, um, in addition to lots of different people, um, always look very pallid to me when you juxtapose them with photographs. And so um, uh, my work over the past, especially 15 years, has been very, very detailed, uh, very high chroma, very high contrast, because I want to be able to freely mix and match stuff um, uh, with photographs. And of course, it all being digital, it's, you know, it's a very plastic and flexible world now to do that. So layering is the other magic thing. Um, if you're not an illustrator, uh, um, layers are absolutely magic. Um, this is just a simple explanation of how I build up uh, a fish illustration, um, one of the small pan fish. Uh, everything is on different layers. This is a, a very simple sort of three layer, layer example that I put together to show non-illustrators uh, why layering is so magical. In fact, um, for this actual illustration, there are, I don't know, probably at least a dozen layers that I keep and I probably a dozen um, more temporary layers. Like when I do uh, an animal's eye, uh, the pupil, the iris, some of the iris detail, uh, if it's a terrestrial animal, the sky shine, um, the specular highlight, the uh, eyelids, everything is on a separate layer and I can twiddle those layers in terms of opacity and detail and whatnot. And then say in, in the case of eyes, I usually don't keep the, all those layers on. When I'm satisfied that it has the spark of life to it, then I just collapse them all down. But layers are absolutely wonderful. The other thing I do that, that aside from very broad kind of airbrushy type soft brush stuff, that's probably the, the most common other kind of brush that I use. So I don't use texture brushes or anything like that, except for uh, taking my hard round brushes or soft brushes and uh, um, turning up the spatter technique. It gives me a, a sort of randomized spatter that um, I use fairly often for things like um, uh, fish, especially, and, and uh, um, some kinds of invertebrates and, and amphibians and things that have very complex uh, skin textures uh, that I find that uh, spattering works really well. But most of what you're seeing here is built up in separate layers. These orange dots are not spattering. That Those were actually drawn in by hand because in this case, uh, it's a pumpkin seed uh, fish. Um, the, um, I did not want a random effect. Um, they, it looks like a very random pattern, but it's not. And, and so I hand drew all of the bright orange spots. Um, uh, this was not an illustration that was done for ichthyologists. So, I mean, life is just too short to draw fish scales. Um, uh, I have no patience with that at all. So, um, uh, because the exact configuration of the scales was not critical to this illustration, uh, I have a bunch of different Adobe Illustrator scale patterns that I can use. 
um, and I just stretch and pull them over the course of the fish. And that's where the scale patterning comes from. And um, as I'm working along, I have, in addition to uh, uh, elements of the illustration being on separate layers so that I can keep one thing from interfering with another. Uh, I can also adjust the transparency and with layer masks, the visibility of what's there. So it's an incredibly uh, um, flexible technique. I mean, in the old days, I do an illustration like this in watercolor and my client would come in and say, gee, I wish those stripes were a little darker. And, you know, you just want to jump out a window. Um, uh, whereas in Photoshop these days, it's no big deal at all. So all this, all this, that's another um, sort of magical thing that Photoshop gives you. Undo and layers gives just tremendous flexibility and speed when I'm working on these things. And these variations that I'm showing you are just me fiddling with the opacity of different layers here to get, especially in the case of live fish, the colors are so subtle and so changeable that I can fiddle with it to my heart's content until I get something that I like. And that's the magic of layers. Here's the um, uh, some of the finished stuff. I very often take advantage of um, photo backgrounds to make the, the in this case, a two-page plate look much more interesting. Uh, freshwater fish um, for my Cape Cod guide. And um, as I say, I, I, as an illustrator, I'm thinking about very punchy colors and lots and lots of detail because I want to very flexibly mix my illustrations with uh, photography and not have the illustrations look overly pallid. So um, uh, uh, Brown Pelican from uh, the most recent book I did is a field guide to the mid-Atlantic coast. So that was fun get back. Brown pelicans are one of my favorite birds. And, um, here's an um, ultra close-up of the eye. Um, so it's, it's just a tiny, tiny portion of the illustration. And again, um, it's all layers. Um, I don't use a super amount of layers with when I do my birds, but I use many, many temporary layers to get the eyes to look just so. And after I'm through fiddling with you know the subtleties of the detail and how shiny it is, et cetera, I very often will collapse those down, but it's very flexible. The um, other thing that you know, especially with for field guide illustrations and whatnot, is I remember I got to meet um, and get to know a bit Roger Tory Peterson, the famous bird artist, because um, he lived in Connecticut, not far from where I live, still live now. And um, he would take days, literally, of working, of course, in conventional media in the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, on his bird plate illustrations, because once he had decided where a bird was going to be, that was it. There was no flexibility and stuff. Whereas these days in Photoshop, every one of these birds is a whole bird. They've been superimposed on each other, but I can take, for example, that snowy egret in the back there and pull it right out, and it's a separate whole snowy egret illustration. So in the case of this, I did a double page spread for my um, mid-Atlantic guide, but um, that didn't work for a variety of reasons for the book I'm working on now, a field guide to the Connecticut River. So I wanted a vertical plate and it was nothing. It was just literally the work of minutes to uh, pull apart this plate and rejigger it as a single page vertical plate. So that kind of flexibility again, because of layering and because the magic of digital media is, is just wonderfully flexible. Here you can see, a, um, uh, I mentioned that, that spattering technique. Hopefully you can see the, the adjustment of these brushes I've made. They're mostly hard, sometimes slightly soft brushes where I've turned up the random spatter effect on them, which was really helpful for dealing with the, the look and texture of butterfly wing scales. Uh, so, but, but mostly what you're looking at is hard round uh, brushes uh, drawn in every little hair by hand um, uh, in Photoshop. Um, uh, I played with different textures on these um, uh, beetles for a while. Um, 
these tiger beetles to to get it just so so i actually did some a little bit of, of filtering to get the uh, a texture i was happy with for these very very shiny iridescent uh, tiger beetle um uh wing carapace but um uh uh, the other thing um, that I've done recently and that I have not done a lot of, I've mostly have done birds and other things for the field guides, is mammals. Um, and I was very concerned about, in this case, the eastern coyote, about getting the, what is, you know, you think of coyotes as just, just the sort of brown, tawny color. But when you look at them carefully, there are all kinds of subtle color and textural details that uh, I wanted to try to capture because it was a fairly close view uh, of, in this case, a coyote snout. And um, every line was put there by hand. And all that experience of decades of working with pen and ink and the pressure sensitivity of, of being able to uh, smoothly adjust thickness and thinness of line, all that translates um, thankfully, into the Wacom tablet. So um, uh, I'm, uh, although I don't do pen and ink anymore, all of that experience and all of that training is still very live in these illustrations. Um, in this case, uh, I wanted to do a plate on the canids of uh, New England. So gray fox, uh, red fox, and Although officially we don't have timber wolves, in fact, we almost certainly do in the northern parts of Maine. And so, um, and, and certainly from an environmental history point of view, wolves were a major part of, of um, the ecology of New England, which have disappeared and now kind of ironically reappearing in the guise of our very large, um, very, very hefty uh, coyotes again. So, um, that um, I was very concerned to get the, uh, um, the, in this case, fur textures just so. And it's there's no, unfortunately, Photoshop filter that will really help much with that. It's all just line drawing. But um, as I say, I can, um, instead of spending, you know, a week or two on a plate like this, um, it, it, I don't remember exactly, but it was a matter of full-time days, maybe three days uh, to do this particular plate. And of course it's very flexible. Um, I can mix and match that wolf. Um, somebody, a friend of mine is dying to get a t-shirt of it. So I'll probably do that with it at some point. But um, in addition to what I'd call sort of traditional um, biomedical illustrations, uh, my books afford me the opportunity to do some complex mapping and other kinds of conceptual illustrations that I've really, really come to enjoy. 99% um, of this was done in uh, Photoshop. I think maybe I did the map outline in, in Illustrator and then brought it in. But um, in this case, uh, this is for my Mid-Atlantic guide that um, just came out um, early last year and uh, goes from New York Harbor down to Cape Hatteras. And uh, this is talking about the Wisconsin and glaciation, which peaked about 25,000 years ago. And um, uh, most of what is now the continental shelf off the mid-Atlantic coast of the U.S. was dry land at that point. In fact, it was very, very cold in these areas. These um, ecologically, um, people have done pollen studies that showed that these areas, uh, which are very temperate now, uh, were really more like um, Labrador uh, uh, up in the Canadian Maritimes 25,000 years ago. So um, I really like doing these sort of conceptual illustrations and the old rivers that cross the, uh, um, uh, what's now the continental shelf um, deep underwater are, are the source of all those underwater canyons that, that offshore fishermen love. Uh, and that plate helps to explain why. Um, I, I like doing these conceptual sort of illustrations. And um, uh, as a photographer, I of course have gotten into drones. I have a couple of drones and um, I hadn't really thought about it when I thought about drone photography. I most mostly thought about, you know, aerial photos. And of course I use those, but what I didn't realize was how useful a drone was gonna be for essentially collecting natural landscape textures. So, 
what does a maritime grassland look like? What does a salt marsh look like? You know, um, do I have the right angle, um, uh, aerial angle on um, uh, uh, small maritime forest areas? I'm, I essentially think of the drone almost less as a, a aerial photography vehicle and, and, and more as a vehicle for collecting the textures I want from my conceptual illustrations. So um, uh, I, I love this sort of photo illustration, sort of amalgam of things. And ironically, the drone has been very useful for that sort of stuff. This is another conceptual thing where I was trying to explain because of salt aerosols and that effect that, that it has pervasive effect for miles inland from the coast along these barrier islands we have on the, uh, uh, on the coast, um, uh, I essentially wanted to create a cross section that explains all of these different things. And it's just so much fun to have this idea as, um, as an author and then um, have the flexibility to illustrate it. Here, this is another conceptual illustration in this case, um, trying to explain why the Atlantic Menhaden is such a keystone species for the essentially the entire ecology of the um, uh, US Atlantic coast. And I'm not sure how far Menhaden get up in terms of the Canadian Maritimes, but certainly for us, it's a keystone fish. Whales eat it, large predatory fish eat it, sport fish, you know, etc. So, um, uh, again, a complex conceptual illustration um, that I can do. And because I'm my own client, I can do it as much as I want. Uh, I'm really into maps. Um, I love beautiful, detailed, authoritative maps. And of course, there's a lot of diagrams that go along with things. These are all done in Adobe Illustrator, but, um, but I do all my own mapping as well. And I'm still a photographer 50 years later. Um, uh, that was a thrilling part of all of this. And it's, it's just so plastic because, you know, I come home with these digital photographs in this case, um, this is down on the Outer Banks. A friend and I climbed over the dune line and we were just, our draws, jaws just dropped. Uh, this was double-crested cormorants going from uh, just south of Nags Head for about five or six miles all the way down to the um, uh, Oregon Inlet. This is just a tiny portion of the mass of those birds. It was just spectacular. And of course, it's, you know, as soon as I've got these things on my chip, I bring it home and it's just another file on the hard drive. But it's it's still really thrilling to get out in natural environments and and collect things. I, I'm inspired all the time by what I see and what I photograph as a photographer uh, in terms of what I do as an illustrator uh, as an illustrator. Um, this is, and ultimately everything gets managed together in uh, InDesign. Um, so I'm uh, InDesign, Illustrator, and Photoshop are my core sort of Adobe Creative Suite um, applications. And um, it's a little baffling to people when I show them a, a book in progress because it looks to them as if it's a finished book. And of course, it's not edited and there's huge value add that, that the Yale Press editors bring to the equation. But um, I lay everything out myself. I just can't imagine as... Um, doing years of illustration and years of writing and handing in a double space manuscript and a pile of illustrations and kind of what crossing my fingers and hope that things come out. Uh, I, I've never worked that way. Even um, uh, the my first uh, ornithology lab manual book back in the early 90s was laid out in PageMaker. So I've always had that flexibility. And um, a couple things about this plate. One is that you can see that I knew when I did this white shark illustration that it was going to be juxtaposed with photographs. And so I wanted it to be very, very detailed and punchy enough to stand up to, to direct comparison to photos. And also, I had this idea about the fishing boats in Chatham and the gray seals that congregate around them and the white sharks that are drawn in by the um, uh, white sharks. Um, I had that idea months before any of this was written out or anything, but I could take and, and assemble the illustrations in Photoshop and um, 
uh, put everything together because uh, I don't know, this just sort of vision of this plate arrived in my head one day and check it all out long before um, anything else was ready about this particular chapter. And that kind of pre-visualization, I can't imagine doing this kind of book any other way. I mean, it really, to me, has to be done this way to get an intimate um, uh, cross association between uh, photos and illustrations and um, uh, uh, luckily have a great working relationship with the Yale Press uh, folks. And uh, my books are assembled in InDesign. They're all edited actually in InDesign too. We've got several editors who are very comfortable with it. And so the whole process is really um, very plastic, especially when you compare it to the old days. So now I'm working on this Connecticut River book and doing essentially same kind of thing. These are um, adult on the right and immature red-tailed hawks. Uh, um, in the fall, we get huge congregations of tree swallows down in the estuary area of the Connecticut River. So illustrating these guys. Um, uh, but lately, um, I think, um, uh, at least for the moment, I don't plan to do any other books after I'm finished with the Connecticut River book. I sort of um, a little bit tired. I've always set short deadlines. I do these 400 page fully illustrated books in about two and a half years. And um, it's uh, it's been intense, uh, wonderful, but intense. And I've, I wanna do something else for a while after that. And I really miss conventional media and drawing and especially painting. And so um, uh, my sort of future planned adventure for now is getting back to doing um, oil painting and things. So thank you very much for having me speak. As we can do questions, etc. Questions, anybody? Hi, Pat. Yeah, I've, I've got a question. Uh, hi, Patrick. It's nice to finally hear you talk after being Facebook friends for a while. Yes. So, and it's very nice to see your process. Um, I, I was just going to ask, have you experimented with other programs other than Photoshop? I've uh, Just especially with blending. Uh, and, and if not, what are, your, what are your tips for blending within Photoshop? Ooh. I, you know, because of the nature of the illustrations I do, um, th there's not a lot of blending here, um, maybe in the eye shine and, you know, subtle things. So, um, soft brushes, very low opacities, um, working in layers and, and experimenting until I get it just so. I mean, I wish I could say after 50 years as an illustrator that I just, you know, sometimes I just see something and I sit down and I do it and everything just flows. But, um, uh, I've never been much of a colorist. I'm a, uh, I'm a draftsman at heart. And, um, and so for subtleties of shading and blending and stuff like that, um, my technique, I, th I suspect, would strike you as kind of painful, is lots of layers, lots of tentativeness, lots of fiddling around until I get it just so. And so I'm not sure for the soft brushes um, that I have anything especially wise to say about it, except layers, layers, layers. Um, uh, um, what, what else did you ask about, aside from oh, soft brushes? Just just uh, if experience with other software suites for for rendering. But oh, the yeah, yeah. You know, I've, really just I've looked at Corel and other things, and um, I'm so used to Photoshop and, you know, my deadlines are self-imposed, but they're realistic, uh, or they're real enough. And I just, um, I don't know. Uh, I well, guess if I wanted to, and it definitely works. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, part of it is the style I'm using. It's very linear, very drawing oriented, and so the ability to make the brushes behave as if they were oil paints or you know other kinds of media or textures. I just, I don't really. It doesn't. It's not part of my style, I guess, as an illustrator. Um, and uh, these days, especially because you always want what you can't have, I'm desperate to get back to doing oil painting 
in oil paints um, on canvas or on board or, you know, or, or doing colored pencil drawings or whatnot. And, you know, just to get back to the craftiness of using my hands again, um, instead of sitting in front of a monitor all day. Uh, so uh, I guess um, I have Corel, at least some older versions of it, but I've, I've never really been tempted to um, I, I just, I'm a one trick pony in terms of the illustrations. I, I do what I do. I have a thing that works and, um, and I just keep on doing that. There's and nothing it, wrong with being a specialist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, you know, all these illustrate, they're very linear. They're almost more drawings than paintings. And so it lends itself to that fairly simple, uh, uh, hard round brush, pressure sensitive, uh, repeated over and over a million times until feather looks like a feather. Thanks, Pat. Thanks. That was that was great. Uh, you know, having you know enjoyed and uh, your work for so many years, seeing this this how that how things you know get put together and 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 how you uh, especially how you interact. Uh, make your uh, photographs and, and images, uh, you know, connect together through the, uh, through your palette and contrast is, is really, really interesting. I see there's a couple of people uh, have hands raised in the uh, participants list. Uh, Laura Jones uh, in biology has posted a question I was kind of interested in too, because I also love maps. Um, how do you visualize your maps in the correct proportions, especially the one that you showed of the, uh, the coastline? What references do you, do you use? Oh, um, Google Earth and Google Maps, of course, to start. Uh, let me see if I can dig that out. Um, of course, it's stretched out. Um, this is even more severely stretched out. Uh, uh, it, it's a two-page plate uh, spread in the book, uh, um, but the proportions have been stretched out here horizontally a bit. And um, I... Uh, did uh, do a lot of pre-visualizing in uh, Google Earth uh, to to get the I, I wanted this stretch from about Cape Lookout all the way up to New York City and where you could see the 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 terminal moraine of the Laurentide Glacier was important because this is all at the peak of the Ice Age um, and. Uh, um, working with um, uh, the U.S. agencies, NOAA and USGS, the Geological Survey and whatnot, there's a lot of good, if frustratingly fragmentary, studies that have been done on all these underwater canyons and everything else. And so um, almost all of my, you know, visual references, at least these days, come from rooting around in Google uh, looking at Google Maps, fiddling around with viewpoints in, in Google Earth. Um, once I had the viewpoint I wanted um, uh, for, for these hard-edged areas and certainly for the, the modern coastline to ghost it in so people would have some idea what they were looking at relative to something familiar. That was all done in Illustrator. And then the outlines were brought in and the rest of it was done in Photoshop just essentially as a big illustration. Um, I think I used a lot of that spatter brush technique um, and, uh, to get some of this, um, you know, it's kind of a, I'm, I'm, it's, it's good not to think too deeply about these things because this kind of illustration has, is done in magic scale. Like if you could be up in the International Space Station or something and look down on this view, it wouldn't look anything like this. You wouldn't see that kind of texture and yada, yada. There would be all kinds of atmospheric stuff going on as well. So there's a, a kind of magic realism going on in these kinds of illustrations. But, but um, mostly it's, you know, once I've got the hard edges, it's me as an illustrator um, drawing in the stuff. Uh, so, um, hopefully that's a useful answer. Shelly or, uh, Nick, you've got your hands up. You can, I think you can unmute if you want to ask, uh, ask your question. Oh. Or, or not. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, thanks, Patrick. This is so beautiful. And uh, my first, um, the first moment I became a fangirl <laughs> was your manual of ornithology. Yeah. And I wondered if you could just talk 
a little bit about what the, the nature of your collaborations with um, with biologists and scientists, like how does that, obviously you come in with a, a huge amount of background knowledge. Um, how does that collaboration work? Um, well, for years and years um, when I was in the medical school, um, you know, I, I got to know a lot of the surgeons who publish frequently uh, very well. And so I would go in to the operating room and, you know, do photographs and, and, um, and we uh, talk through a lot of different stuff. Um, I, I just, it's, it's been some time now since I was actively doing that, but it was a very close collaboration with stuff. It's, it's wonderful in the, in the sense that, you know, the, um, I have to say, 99% um, of the people at Yale are just really classy, high-functioning individuals. They're just, you know, um, fun to deal with. So, so I got to be good friends with um, a number of different people I worked with intensively over the years, and and um, and so it it really did feel like a very close. Um, uh, genuine collaboration with stuff. Um, and especially when we sort of transitioned to doing interactive media stuff and whatnot, I worked with a, with a core group of, since most of what we were doing, uh, especially in the early days, was very radiology um, and imaging intensive, uh, um, that uh, I got to know a lot of um, nuclear cardiologists and, and um, uh, cardiac radiologists and, and echo people and whatnot. My best friend and mentor, Carl Jaffe, um, is a cardi cardiac radiologist. And um, <laughs> even back in the days when those, uh, that was a rare beast. Uh, so it, it was wonderful to closely collaborate with them as, as, as an integral part of a team. And, um, uh, and now I'm a team of one. You know, um, my illustrator is a pain in the ass. He's always slow. Um, uh, and, and, um, but on the other hand, I can tell him to do anything I want to. So, um, uh, so that probably slows down the books sometimes. I think, you know, it's the sort of devils and angels thing is I can dream up something like this view of the continental shelf and whatnot. And I can spend days on it because, you know, it's my toy and I can do with it what I want. Um, uh, on the other hand, I, I, it's probably not the most efficient way to work in some ways because I don't have, I do have the constraints of time. I always sh set short deadlines because I want the book to come out um, mm -hmm. and not noodle around with it forever. Uh, so I'm very, very disciplined that way uh, and self-motivated. But um, but I can take as, you know, I probably did several dozen illustrations for the Mid-Atlantic thing. At one point, I was going to do some some offshore stuff and deal with, because there's so much offshore fishing that's done in the Mid-Atlantic coast. But um, I ended up having to cut that out. So I have a whole bunch of plates that are just sort of orphans, uh, swordfish and, you know, other kinds of things that that um, don't I don't have anywhere to put. And if I'd been a little bit more clever as an author and planner, I wouldn't have spent that time. But, you know, I love to do illustrations. So in, in the end, so what? Um, it was fun. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. Are there any, uh, any other, uh, any of the students have any, any, any questions uh, particular? I know uh, there's one question uh, uh, about, um, uh, about injury. Um, how do you uh, prevent... Uh, uh, injuring your hand with the with the amount of work that you do. Oh yeah, um, I have I have worried over the years about repetitive stress, but um, uh, probably the the only place I've ever genuinely had uh, an experience with at least mild um, uh, sort of ergonomic issues related to d my digital work is. I think like a lot of illustrators um, working in Photoshop, uh, I'm right-handed. So my right hand is on the drawing tablet, drawing things, but my left hand sits sort of cocked at an angle um, on the left edge of my keyboard all the time. And I'm modifying things with command or option or, or you know, various keystrokes and whatnot. And because my hand is sitting there at that sort of awkward, um, cocked angle for mm, 
could be weeks at a time, essentially eight hours or 10 hours a day, that um, uh, I, I began sometimes, it hasn't happened for the last few years at all. Sometimes I'll take off my watch and I have a, a wrist brace um, with a stiff piece of plastic that keeps me from, um, that, that keeps my wrist straight instead of naturally bending it the way um, uh, I, I sort of do if, if I'm not wearing a brace. But other than that, um, I haven't had too much of a problem with it. Uh, uh, sometimes I've been working very intensively and, you know, it just, you get tired after a while, even if you love doing illustrations. And, um, but one of the things I've always insisted upon doing is using the largest graphics tablet that I can get because in, you know, drawing 101, we all learn to draw with our, our whole arms and not just with your wrist. And uh, the large graphics tablet facilitates that. You could use a, I suppose I could do what I do in a tiny, you know, bamboo tablet or something, but um, I, I really would worry about re repetitive stress there because it would just be me tweaking my wrist, you know, in a tiny space constantly. Whereas with these big, I don't know, 12 by 14 tablets, I'm drawing the way I was taught to draw with my whole arm and not just my fingers and my hand. Uh, so I've been lucky is, is the bottom line. Yeah, I'm the opposite. I, I the smallest, ta the smaller the tablet, the better. I just, I just draw. With my yeah, hand. it's, it's all, you know, your ergon ergonomics, your anatomy and, and your style of doing things. For me, the big tablet, I think, um, keeps me out of that repetitive area. And the other thing I've learned, you know, is just if, if I'm tired and something hurts, I just stop doing that for a while. I, you know, I may go right for a while. Um, I bet it's just, even if you love what you do, there are times when you're just not up to yet another goddamn bird. Um, and so I'll go right for a while. There's one, one last question. We may not have enough time to cover it because it might be the kind of question that really doesn't have a short answer. But uh, uh, one of the grad students asks, what advice do you have for someone looking to learn how to illustrate in Photoshop? Ooh, I, well, I've been doing it so long that I'm probably not the right, right person to ask, but when, you know, people who are like undergraduates or high school students or whatnot will come to me from time to time and ask about stuff and looking back over it for 50 years, um, what are the core skills that I still use every day, um, and it all has to do with um, manual dexterity and your ability to draw. Uh, I don't find that, um, especially if you have the right equipment, and that's a big if, if you're a student, but you know, if you've got a decent drawing tablet and you've got a decent computer that can keep up with you and doesn't slow you down from a sort of digital lag because you don't have enough RAM or whatnot, um, that, uh, Photoshop doesn't take that long to learn, you know? Uh, it, it just, uh, what I would say, if, if you want to invest time is draw, 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 draw um, uh, on newsprint or decent drawing paper or whatever, just, and, and that's ironically sort of at the end of this, even though I do draw all the time, at least, you know, on, on plastic tablets uh, is, um, I've begun to miss um, uh, conventional drawing. And so it's why I'm not anxious to leap into another book project right now. Um, I, I would just draw. I just, um, I, I found it thrilling when I first started getting serious about being an artist um, when I was in high school. And I still find it thrilling, you know, Let's see if I can find one of these old, you know, I just love daylilies. We have a garden full of them and I just love drawing them. Um, and I still do. Uh, and um, uh, everything I do with colored pencils, especially because of my particular style, relates very directly to what I'm doing in Photoshop and vice versa. So I found that, you know, over the years, 
the thing that has uh, stood me in greatest stead in terms of core skills is drawing. Yeah, that's that's a real a real a real true a real true sentiment that we with our with the medical illustration students, especially when we have applicants, you know, that that's also, you know, how they they want it. Like, how can I you know improve my portfolio? And, and the answer is always just draw, just go out and draw more. Yeah, um, it may sound frustrating because, you know, it's sort of sexy to get into Photoshop and the ins and outs of layers and all that other stuff. I don't think, you know, f from a student's point of view, I tell them, you know, a few weeks of this stuff and you're going to know all that. Mm -hmm. So, but a few weeks of drawing and you'll be slightly better than you are now. But a few years of drawing, you'll be very, very much better. Uh, whereas, um, you know, it's like the old joke about how many years of experience you have. With Photoshop, you know, 20, 30 years of Photoshop, I'd say I've, I've had two years of Photoshop experience 10 times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it, it's just, it's, it's not that deep. It can be intimidating if you've never fired up Photoshop and trying to figure out what it all means. But, um, uh, but uh, I think the time spent drawing um, will last you the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for, uh, for, uh, for speaking with us today and, and showing us this in incredible amount of work. I think, you know, we, you probably could have done hours and hours of, of, you know, all the, all the things that you've been, uh, all the things that you've been doing for over your career, but it's always great to see you, to see your work and to hear you talk about it. So thank oh, you thanks. Again. It's a great honor. Um, I, uh, um, as I said, I didn't come out of one of the programs, so I've always been, of course, fascinated with the programs. And I know folks um, lucky enough to get to know some some of you folks in Toronto and Johns Hopkins and a few of the other programs. And, and it's just, uh, you know, when um, young people come to me and say, how do I get involved in this stuff? And they're sort of fascinated probably to an unhealthy degree with the fact that I didn't go to a program and it's just, you know, that was 50 years ago. The circumstances were absolutely unique. And um, I tell them it's just a hell of a lot easier if you go someplace where people will tell you what you need to know. Um, so instead of having to discover it sort of organically and back into things um, the way I did. So um uh, yeah, but um, it, it, it's a great honor to speak at the program. Uh, Nasha, I think we're still, we're, we're okay. We're going to keep talking. Um, yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, if uh, uh, Dr. Lynch is okay with uh, going into uh, the 115, but at that point at 115, we'd have to move to the grad student lunch, if that's all right. Hmm. Yeah, that's fine. I'll have to bail at 115 because um, uh, my 18-month-old um, granddaughter is going to come to visit. So I'm on babysitter duty for about four hours this afternoon. So <laughs> I want to have a bite to eat before Hurricane Aria arrives. <laughs> All right. Well, I, so um, I any guess... other questions or are, are you able to see some of the, uh, I've been backing up to some of the slides, hopefully to illustrate what I'm talking about. I'm not sure if people can see that. But yeah, anyway. we can still, the, uh, we can see the, the thumbnails on the left there and. Uh, oh, good. And the big day lily. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it helps. Um, I'm visual. It helps to show things. <laughs> what a surprise. <clears throat> And, you know, for younger people, um, I, 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 I say this particularly to David because I know he's into it, but um, I spent um, my whole childhood obsessively building models and painting models. So, um, you know, if, if kids ask me what to do, I say build models, you know. Um, you know, video games are fine, yada, yada. But um, if you, if you want to do anything remotely like what I do, uh, build models. Um, Patrick, would, would you be able to do the virtual lunch with the students? Um, as I said, I'm um, uh, 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 my granddaughter's going to arrive. Um, not uh, uh, probably somewhere, maybe around one thirty, quarter of two. Okay. So I'll I'll have oh. to bail out for that. But I have my priorities. 
Yes, we we know and we respect that. So we are gonna. She's about this tall. Yes. So uh, let's uh, thank everybody for attending uh, our seminar and all grad students. Um, obviously, BMC uh, uh, priority are invited to the uh, virtual lunch for the next uh, twenty minutes. Okay, so we let uh, Patrick go um, after that and enjoy his time with. Uh, Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for the honor of speaking. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, lots of fun to see folks again. So hello. And if I'm ever in Toronto, I'll let you know. Yes, please come and visit us. You'll yeah. love it. Okay. We have a lot of birds. So. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah okay. So you have the link. I emailed you the link and I will see you then, there in a moment. Okay. Okay. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Bye. Patrick.